for folks who maybe haven't uh, run across the Handy Answer book series before, I guess I would describe this as the sort of book that you keep on the coffee table and read read a couple of chapters or read a couple of questions and answers uh, and then put it back down. It's not a read it from the beginning to the end book in a sitting, is it? You're so much classier than I am because I always tell people it's a bathroom book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can sit it, sit it in the bathroom and uh, if you have a couple of minutes on your hand, you can dig into a chapter. And uh, exactly, you're right. It's designed to dip into and delve into. Uh, when I was a boy growing up, uh, I don't know if you had these here in the States, but we used to get a lot of treasury books. Um, and by that, I mean like the boys' treasury of history and the girls' treasury of, you know, um, of things like that. And it was designed for you to just educate yourself on a whole range of, of things like a buffet. This yeah. It's kind of a buffet book. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I think is really uh, key in this book is you don't have to be a historian. You don't have to be a military scholar. Um, you know, it's really written in a fashion that anybody can pick it up and get something out of it. Uh, or sharp, I have a vague memory of who this guy is. Let me look up and see what he really did during the war, that sort of thing. And, and I think in that regards, um, when you were writing it, was that your audience a really broad audience as compared to sort of, uh, you know, history buffs? Yeah, I think his, history buffs are, um, the, and I am one myself. So there is definitely a place on every history buffs bookshelf for general overview books. Um, but I also am a big fan of of reaching an audience that perhaps doesn't know as much as they would quite like about not just the history of their military, but how it runs today. Uh, a lot of people don't know, for example, beyond rescuing um, people who are threatened on the seas, what the Coast Guard actually does. They don't know that the Coast Guard uh, perhaps plays a key role um, in fighting smugglers of drugs and human trafficking, you know. Um, and And even if they do, they probably don't know that the earliest Coast Guard uh, lighthouse keepers, uh, a number of them were females who, who behaved in a very heroic way. Well, I, I'm glad you brought up the Coast Guard, often forgotten. But you mm -hmm. answered a question, and I think it's on page 249, that I, I uh, when I saw it, I said, well, I don't know the answer to that at all. And that was like, what's the origin of the racing stripe that's on the Coast Guard uh, ships? And you gave an answer that makes sense to me. Um, well, and, yeah, and you look at a Coast Guard vessel and you you see that stripe and you think, oh, OK, yeah, that's a Coast Guard ship as opposed to a Navy ship. Uh, and, and that was exactly what the Coast Guard was trying to achieve. It was it was branding and it didn't exist um, before 1967. Yeah, the, again, the, that's the you know one paragraph answer to a question that you kind of, you know, yeah, that's stuck in my head somewhere. I don't really know the answer to that. Um, on the Air Force, um, I think it's page uh, 329, you have a discussion on one of my favorite uh, airframes called the Warthogs. And, oh, yeah. and you hear the people, friend. even today, they talk about Warthogs. And, and, and I think if you're uninitiated, you don't know what they're talking about. And this is the kind of book that you pick up and you go, yeah, I've heard them use that term on the news or something, but what are they talking about? Well, you've answered that question, haven't you, Richard? Absolutely. I mean, I love the Warthog or the Thunderbolt, as it's, I guess, more properly called, but everybody I know calls it the Warthog. Uh, and some people used to call it the Devil's Cross because of the shape it made. I guess that depends on which side you're on. But, yeah, that is um, the best friend the infantry soldier has in combat quite often essentially a whole aircraft built around a big 30 mil rotary cannon um the pilot sits in this armored bathtub and the number of, of smart munitions maverick missiles ordnance that hang on the wings of this thing it is a flying artillery support battalion essentially uh, and I just adore the A-10. I saw one recently flying at the Colorado Air Show, in fact, this past summer. Well, and every now and again, they say, well, we're going to get, because it's an old, old air from this, and we're going to get rid of the A-10 Warthog, yep. and all kinds of people come to its defense. And it may be old, uh, but, mm -hmm. man, it does the job for which it's designed. And, and again, I think that's the kind yeah. of uh, uh, and I, I question mean, you answer. The, look at the B-52 in that same light, you know. And the reason these airframes exist after decades, now we're looking at over half a century in some cases, is that they do the job they were built for so well. 
um, there's no need to go back to the drawing board for something like the B-52 um, or, or the A-10 or the C-130, you know? No, absolutely. And, and uh, a, a lot of these uh, uh, pieces of equipment, if you will, um, that the military use, uh, their names become kind of iconic, but you may have lost, maybe you saw it in, well, mentioned in a movie or in a book, and one of those is the Higgins boat, um, which uh, comes up into a question you posed on page 151, was, which was, what was that boat that won World War II? And well, you, you uh, talk yeah. about that story, and I think it's a, a, a classic example of, I've heard Higgins boats before, but I don't really remember what the hell they're tied to. Tell us yeah, about you that. Could- Listen to this full episode and more on the Apple Podcasts app, Blog Talk Radio, Google Podcasts, or iHeartRadio. And now streaming on Amazon Music, Audible, and Spotify.